Hello, everyone. I'm Vin Ebenu inside the WOBM newsroom with Tom's River Police Chief Mitch Little on the first episode of Ask the Chief, where we'll be bringing in police chiefs across the shore where you, and residents will be able to ask them questions about different things going on in town or discuss certain issues that they want more clarification on or more answers on. So, Chief, welcome to the newsroom and welcome to Ask the Chief. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Good so morning. We got, some, we got some topics to discuss, some listener submitted questions and feedback about sure. different programs or certain things going on around town. I know one thing you introduced a while back was Operation Watchdog, right. which you know, works with businesses and residents to uh, help solve crimes by you know submitting tips and submitting information, submitting uh, that, that piece of evidence maybe they captured on a, sure. on a camera. How has that been working since it was implemented? Sure. Well, we know that uh, anything on video is a huge deterrent. Uh, people see video, they see houses with surveillance issue, uh, cameras and uh, systems, and they tr tend to stay away from those. They don't want to be caught on video, obviously, because then we post it and people get caught. Um, so we put out this Operation Watchdog where we would like people to let us know if they have a surveillance system. Uh, whether it's a, a separate company or it's Ring or any of these other apps uh, that people use to let us know where they are. So if we have a crime in the area, we can literally plot them on a map, go to their house, ask them if they might have video during that time period. We'll all ask only to look at that video for that time period. And if we do find something, we would ask permission from the owner if we could just take that one little piece of the video. We're not, we're not accessing their video systems. We're not taking the entire thing. We only want that one piece that might help us later on. And we can actually track if we find enough people signing up for this, that the, the person, the suspect, whatever may have taken a certain route. And we can actually look on a map and look at that route to see who may have captured that on video and go to those specific houses. Before the Operation Watch program, we would have to go house to house and ask people if they have video. But if we have them plotted on a map and we have them identified, it's easier to go right to that location. And it makes things so much easier. Right now, we have about 6,000 people um, mapped between okay. that system and the ring and the neighbor app. We're able to identify those 6,000 people and go there if we need to. Have you seen a, a growing response since it was put in by residents and businesses that say, okay, I have, uh, I have a camera at home or a device and I think I saw something, so let me share it with the police. Do you yes. feel like that's starting to grow? It's, it's huge. We, we see a lot of people obviously sharing with each other. Once they, they sign up to the neighbor app, that will access any system. So any system you have, whether it's Ring or whatever, you'll be able to share your information with neighbors. You can share with us. A lot of people call in the police department and say, hey, listen, I just saw this on the neighbor app. It looks suspicious, or I saw it on my video, and it looks suspicious. Um, we have a growing number of people that are signing up. The ring by itself is automatic. People don't have to sign up for that. So just the fact that they have ring and they sign up to the neighbor app, <clears throat> they actually go on to um, rings mapping system. And then we are actually able to see that and we can go to those locations later. Do you find that home surveillance systems, I mean, they're not, uh, not everybody has like a professional production crew at their right, house, right. you know, the big time cameras and everything. Sure. I know that's a lot of, across the board, a lot of people when we put out articles, news articles, where uh, police departments are searching for suspects, maybe a bank right. robber or something like mm -hmm. that, like the, the image or the picture mm -hmm. kind of looks a little fuzzy or blurred. Right. Does working with some of these home systems bring that roadblock up and trying to figure out who's on the screen or what exactly they're holding yeah. or what they're doing? It, it depends. Obviously, it depends on the system. Some people have very intricate systems. Other people do not. But even, even the, the most basic systems help us. Uh, we might get a clothing description. Sometimes we catch people just based on the way they walk. Um, and people have been identified just by that. Like, hey, I know that guy because he walks like that or whatever. Or we might see a vehicle description matching the owner of that vehicle or whatever. So uh, a lot of things are, are taken into consideration and we do look at everything. So even the less quality videos are helpful. How can you can con continue to grow Operation Watchdog so that more businesses and residents will be encouraged that if they do in fact have a camera outside of their, their home or their, their business that they could work with police and you know their name's not going to be thrown out there and say sure. oh well you know this so and so helped us catch this criminal like what and this right right exactly <laughs> so just just like we're doing here um anytime we can get the message out to people to our residents uh we have pamphlets that we put out uh check our website uh check our facebook page 
um, anything, you know, WOBM, um, Town Square Media has been fantastic to us with putting all this information <laughs> out for us. So uh, we just encourage all the residents to actually, you know, uh, go onto our website, sign up for this, and uh, and we'll look forward to, to hearing from you. Of course. <laughs> Definitely want to get the word out about that. Uh, another operation that uh, was uh, effective over the summer is Operation Brain Freeze. <laughs> And I can't tell you, even driving around times over myself, I've heard it from other residents and other people, just the amount of, um, and it just seems like a lot of kids or teenagers and stuff riding their bikes all over the road mm -hmm. or the sidewalks. Right. And I'm looking at them, they're not wearing helmets and right. they're kind of weaving in and out of the road, like going in front of cars. Right. It's it's kind of like your eyes drop, your jaw drops. It's, sure. it's scary. They <laughs> they feel invincible, as many of us, right. I, right. as many of us do as teenagers. Sure. But, uh, but I've also seen, you know, the good, the effectiveness of this program over the summer where, um, you know, kids or, or people who are wearing helmets are being rewarded. So sure. how did that, uh, how did that work out this summer? How well, did you see it play? Like, like I always <laughs> said, a, a lot of our great ideas come from the officers on the street. Um, they see the need just as you did uh, with, with kids not doing what they should be doing. And it's extremely dangerous. What they want to do is go to a call and have a, a child hurt or somebody mm -hmm. hurt because they were a pedestrian struck or, or bicycle struck. And, and that, that's, that's hard to, to deal with. Um, so we would rather go to a preventative end and try to get people to do things the right way so we don't have to show up and, and obviously um, be there for somebody's tragedy and right. a family's tragedy. So one of our officers came up, uh, Adam Copen, came up with the idea of Operation Brain Freeze. <laughs> and um, it may have been done somewhere else in the country, but he came up with this for us. And it's a great idea when basically the premise is if instead of running around and try to catch people for doing the wrong thing, mm -hmm. we're going to start rewarding people positive reinforcement for doing the right thing. So when our officers see a child or somebody riding in the bike properly, wearing their helmet, doing everything they're supposed to be doing, we're going to stop them and we're going to reward them with a ticket for an ice cream. And the ice cream shops in the area have participated and it's great for them because they get to see members of our community this child that just got a ticket for wearing their helmet and doing the right thing is bringing their whole family to these ice cream shops. So it's good for everybody. And the biggest part of this is the interaction our officers have with our public, with our kids in a positive way. The positive thing is the best because my, people might have a, a certain perception of police officers that we're only out there to make people's lives miserable and write tickets and yeah. you know arrest you or whatever. Yeah. And you know sometimes parents say, "Hey, be good, eat all your dinner," or that officer is going to arrest you, uh, which is not the case. We don't arrest people for not eating their dinner, um, <laughs> so we're we're picking up their room, whatever. So this gives us an opportunity to actually interact with the kids. And we actually had kids that were so excited about this, they wait for officers to come down their street. And we've actually had incidents where kids know where a police officer lives in their neighborhood <laughs> and they go up to the door, they knock on the door and they point to their helmet and say, officer, I'm wearing my helmet. Can you give me a ticket? So um, I want we, ice cream. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so, so it's, it's worked very well. Um, we started off with a couple hundred tickets a summer and we've grown to 635 tickets we gave out this summer by our officers. Okay. And it's, it's working out very well. The officers love it. The kids love it. It's, it's just a great program. Now, is this just a, a warm weather spring summer yes. kind of program? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, nobody's I looking for ice are... cream when it's cold. So. <laughs> Except for me. Right, right, right. <laughs> and maybe, maybe, in the, maybe in the winter we could do uh, some kind of spicy food or something. I, I don't know. But there right, right now in the summer. Operation was, Chili. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say that. <laughs> so uh, we might be able to do something like that. Um, so it's, it's working very well. So I'm glad we did this. I know those are a couple of the Operation Watchdog, Operation Brain Freeze, a couple of the, well, in a way, a positive reinforcements, but cooperation with police. I know one of the... Uh, the other topics we spoke about, I think within the last year or two, is adding armed police officers to Tom's River schools. Right. And it's, it, you could say in the midst, because it's still in the midst, even mm -hmm. a couple of years later, of all these different violence incidents across the country, gun violence. Uh, thankfully, none of that's really happened around here, mm -hmm. but it's a preventative measure, certainly. But how sure. have you seen the that work with schools in terms of uh, officers' interaction with t uh, teachers, right. students, staff, uh, any feedback from parents that you've gotten with sure. having an armed officer in the school? Sure. So for as long as I can remember, we've had school resource officers. Those are regular times for police officers that at a certain point in their career, they want to interact with, with students and the faculty and everything else, and we put them in the schools, and they're in-house, and they prevent so many things because they're little communities. 
you just look at high school north, there's 2,400 kids just in high school north, about 1,400 maybe in high school south, 1,800 in high school east. So each high school has their own school resource officer, we always have, uh, for uh, many years. And then we also had school resource officers in the intermediate schools. That got reduced to one, so uh, Pam Slavin, as an officer, would bounce between intermediate east and intermediate north. Um, recently, we came up that every single school, it's not limited to just high schools or intermediate schools that need protection. Mm -hmm. So what started off is just a security thing where we want to put an armed officer in every school. We partnered with the school system. They were very receptive to this. They, they want to split the cost with us. And we we're able to have retired officers, which is the class three program, go into every single school. So all 14 schools in Tom's River have an armed officer now. The greatest part about this is all these officers are retired officers from our police department and other police departments. And I was a little reluctant at first to take in people from the outside because obviously we haven't worked with these people for 25 years and we only get to know them through an interview. Once we interview the officers, we find out that they're, they're good for us, they're good for the job. Um, I had a sit down with them after they were hired and I was trying to think of a way to actually have them understand how important their job is. Mm -hmm that they had the possibility of interacting with 400 kids, up to 700 kids in a place like East Dover. Um, so it's extremely important, not only for the safety of the school and the parents and the faculty, but for the kids, but also the interaction they're gonna have. And basically the way I placed, uh, I, I put it to them was, this is now your house. You're, you're coming off your other career of 25 years. We want all of your experience to come into your house. And every single, teacher, child, and their families are now your family. And you will protect them as much as you would protect your own family in your own house. And it has gone from that to far beyond my expectations. These officers have developed relationships with the faculty, with the school staff, the administration, and especially the children has been amazing. They know the kids' names. The kids, when I go there and visit these guys, the kids are walking in formation from class to class or event to event, and they're breaking formation to go and hug their officer. Um, the oh. officers have found um, more value in this job sometimes than the job they came from. And, and I look at it this way, is it's almost like being a grandparent. When you raise your own kids, you only have one shot at that. <laughs> and you look at that, it's like, maybe I could have done something different. When you become a grandparent and you've had that history and that experience, you can go back and recognize things earlier. Well, these officers spent an entire career of 25 years or 30 years in their communities all over the state of New Jersey. And I know they have run into things, as we all have, that if I would have just gotten that kid earlier, he wouldn't have died from an overdose. He wouldn't have committed that armed robbery. He wouldn't have done certain things. And they recognize those personality traits. 25 years of police experience is amazing being on the street. When they come back into the schools, they recognize this. They see these kids and they're like, oh, I think I should spend a little more time with Johnny right now because I think he's going on the same path as a kid that I dealt with on my job. And I don't want him to end up like that. And that has been huge. It, it has been amazing. And for some reason, kids identify with uniforms. And it's one of the main reasons I put all the officers in a gray shirts mm -hmm. because I want them to understand that he's not just your friend or she's not just your friend. It's every single officer out there is your friend as well. Right. So if you see an officer... Uh, in Tom's River, in a gray shirt, they're going to help you too. And it's been amazing. Now, how does the, the protocol work that if an officer either hears of a threat uh, through the staff or there's something over the phone, an email comes in, or there's a threat on a bathroom wall mm -hmm. or in on a locker in the hallway, do they, do they have to speak with the principal? Do they have to report directly to you or with the supervisor? Yeah, they, they are Tom's River police officers. Um, they follow our policies. They do everything we do, and there are so many different levels of threats. It can be anything from uh, an anonymous threat made by phone. It can be something written on a wall. It can be a bomb threat. There are so many different ways and so many different levels of these that every one of them has to be taken individually. Um, one thing we have to be careful of is that we don't have social media blowing up these things before they can be properly investigated. Mm -hmm. We've had incidents where a kid in a school would take a picture of something written on a wall that could be weeks old, months old, whatever. They go home to their parents. The parents, the right thing to do is to call the police department. Let us go to the school. Let us investigate it. 
and then we will put out a response that's measured to what we did. Um, what happens then, though, if they don't do that, the parent feels obligated that they're going to post it all over Facebook and social media, and then incites more ex uh, excitement or uh, panic than if it, nothing was mentioned at all or it was investigated first, and then we can put out the proper response. Listen, we saw this on the wall, we investigated, it turned out to be false, and, and then it's the end of the story. We had one time where a parent put something out, it went viral, and we had 700 kids that didn't show up to school the next day, which was completely not the right thing to do. Right. right? So what purpose did that serve? It served no purpose at all. What people should do is call us, let us do our job, let us investigate it, let us understand with administration the proper response to parents if there is enough of a threat there might be a shelter in place if it's more of a threat it might be a lockdown depending on a threat depending on our investigation will dictate our response and then we will be sure to let everybody know exactly what happened when it's over all right and sometimes if it's active and we need people to know right away we'll put it out then but people need to trust us mm -hmm. they need to understand that we're the professionals and the school administration are professionals in handling these things, and they should not take it upon themselves and start posting all this stuff over Facebook. A lot of people hear rumors, and they think it's true, and they post it. Exactly. And, and then, luckily, we're starting to get the public back into mm -hmm. looking at us, where, oh, listen, I'm not going to listen to that post. Let me see what Townsville Police has to say about it, or Town Square Media, or whatever, and then we'll believe that. Mm -hmm. Because then we know at least it's coming from a reliable source. And that, I think, is the most important thing. You're watching Ask the Chief with Times Ever Police Chief Mitch Little. I'm Vin Avenue here in the newsroom. Uh, one uh, crime spot, well, it's not as much of a crime spot anymore. It's a parking lot mm -hmm. right outside our building is the red mm -hmm. carpet, and I doubt there's going to be as much crime in a parking lot. Right. Uh, but I remember we spoke when it started coming down a few months ago. I right. think the, the amount of disorderly persons offenses, I believe, was somewhere in the ballpark of, 90, of like a 90% <laughs> yeah. drop, right. Right. Which, which was amazing in itself. Sure. Have you seen since that? hotel has been demolished and you know put in the garbage or whatever right, right. they do with it that crime across the downtown part of thomas river has gone down it has so when we when we first knocked it down or actually when we first closed it um i think it was last october we did a little bit of a study of two months before what the what the incidents around town were and then we did two months after and you're right we we found that just in that short amount of time about 92 percent of disorderly persons offenses were uh, reduced, which is extreme. But now, in, in order to really look at stats, you have to look over a long term. So we recently just did one for um, 10 months since it's been closed. Um, because obviously, it, I, I call it the incubator for crime. It was where <laughs> it was where a lot of things stem from. So, you know, you could keep taking care of the symptoms and keep arresting people and issuing summonses or whatever. But if you take care of the source, that's where you need to go, right? So we went in there, we did a raid, we figured out that this is where our problems were coming from. Uh, we made uh, more than 15 arrests. We hit them with code violations, whatever. Obviously the end result, they got shut down. And in the past 10 months, compared to the 10 months before, we were able to see a, an overall 30% overall reduction in all disorderly persons offenses, a 55% reduction in burglaries, a 21% reduction in thefts, and a 53% percent reduction in narcotics related offenses, which is huge. Um, and it's it's going right along the lines of, of what we're seeing all over town. We found that all over town, um, we've seen a reduction in thefts by 40% over the last five years, since we started a lot of programs we're doing, um, saturated patrols, directed patrols, things like that. Our community affairs has done a lot, um, getting the word out. And we've seen a 40% reduction in thefts. We've seen a 40% reduction in traffic crashes uh, because of our traffic safety unit and doing the things they need to do. And also an 18% reduction in crashes with injuries. So we're, we're doing something. So, and it, it's all the initiatives that we're doing. So I think, I think we're on the right track. Obviously there's other locations in town that were again, incubators for crime. We had the um, hotel down on uh, Pine Rest. The, you know, the Mercan, the Mercan is another one, well, yeah, right? Is, so now the Parkway that, Hotel. Yeah. So we <laughs> we set our sights on um, the Pine Rest Motel at a 37 East, um, just off coming westbound on 37, just off the Tunney Bridge, and we were able to shut that down. And then we set our sights on the Americana, and we have some things going on with the Americana right now too. I don't know if it's going to be an ultimate shutdown, but we'll we'll see what happens. 
um, they might be changing their tune a little bit. So uh, bottom line is if, you, if you're running a shady business and you're running uh, criminal activity out of there, don't, you know, you're going to be uh, coming, we're going to be coming after you and we're going to look to shut you down. Um, and, and it's been helping a lot. I know one of the things you told me uh, at the beginning of the demo of the red carpet in was, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, you know, half jokingly is that people were coming to that hotel right. from across the road down right. in the South Toms River. Like, right. This isn't right. a, an it, island resort. It, this, or is not, this is not a vacation spot. Um, and we were arresting people with, with IDs from different towns. I was like, okay, so I, yeah, I know Tons River is beautiful and we have a nice Huddy Park and all that, but you, you, you don't want to stay here uh, on your vacation. Uh, so, and that's what was happening. So it was very obvious that that's where the crime was, was emanating from and we need to shut that down. Even, even businesses downtown, 7-Eleven, you would think uh, would be hurting by that. They were actually very happy that we shut them down. Even though they had customers coming in, they were right. doing deals right inside the 7-Eleven. You know, and, and they were glad to see it come down. And they love the view right now, and, and so do I. You Some know, shady things happening in the middle of the night. <laughs> exactly right. Right. So, but right now, now it's it's very temporarily a parking lot, and you can see right into the river, the, the biggest, you know, width of the river, and, and it looks beautiful. So I think this is the beginning of our downtown revitalization. It really is. With uh, population rise across mm -hmm. Tom's River, uh, the only trails Lakewood, I believe, mm -hmm. Do you uh, have enough resources for what you want to do in, in terms of safety, security? Or are you looking to recruit mm -hmm. new officers or, or select new officers out of the police mm -hmm. academy? Sure. We, we're constantly recruiting. Uh, we have a test every three years. So when I first took over as chief six years ago, one of the one things I said to the administration in town hall, that was the mayor, the business administrator, and the council, mm -hmm. was that I want to do everything to make us most efficient as possible first. Let's make sure that we have the right amount of officers on the street. Let's make sure that we have civilians doing what civilians should be doing inside, not having an armed officer at their salary doing paperwork and things like that. We need them on the street. So over the last five or six years, we've done that. We've, we've made the place as efficient as possible, uh, dealt with the resources we have. We were able to hire retired officers back, not only that class three program, mm -hmm. but also put in retired officers and maybe the evidence room or things like that at a, an a extremely reduced salary. Uh, which is good for them. We have an officer with 25 years experience coming back with all that experience and, and we can still use that experience. Um, and just our records bureau having civilians come in and, and work those jobs and things like that. So we've done a lot to revamp that. So then what we do is we do everything by statistics. We're not going to just say, hey, uh, Mr. Mayor, we need five more cops. Well, they're going to know why. They're going to want to have to know why. And I have to be able to tell them why. So I can't just arbitrarily say we would need more cops. We have to show statistically that with the amount of officers we have and the amount of hours they have on the road, how much time are they committed to answering calls and doing investigations and things like that, and how much time are they not committed? I even have to do that per shift. I have to have officers, the right amount of officers per shift because each shift deals with different incidents and a different amount of incidents in different areas of town. So I have to make sure all those, alloc all those resources are allocated properly. Once we show that we're doing everything we possibly can do, but it's not working, and we need a few more, then I will ask for a few more officers. Right now, we're at 163 officers. When I first got hired, we we're at 137, and that was 34 years ago. So we haven't increased that much, but our population has increased yes. tremendously. Uh, so, um, and then obviously in the summer, it increases probably by another 25 or 30,000 with all our um, vacationers, uh, people you know, doing, you know, going to our beach community and things like that, and using our resources and, and facilities in the town. So uh, we do beef that up with class one officers, class twos, things like that. Um, we're constantly recruiting. We recruit from every walk of life. People think we're, we're just rec recruiting white males or whatever. That's absolutely not the case. Right. We go to all the colleges in New Jersey. We go to their sports team, women's, men's, doesn't matter. Um, every group that we want to think of, we go to and we say, we are looking for best officers. And everybody says, what kind of officer are you looking for? The best kind of officer is what we're looking for. We want a great, I don't care your race, religion, whatever, your beliefs. If you're going to be a good officer, we want you. And we have about 300 to 500 applicants every time we have a test. And we might get 10 or 15 officers off that list. So we are getting the cream of the crop. And, and we appreciate that. Yeah, I want to transition off of that mm -hmm. into what the state of police is today and how, mm -hmm. uh, I know we touched on a little bit here, but I know it was something that I brought up to Lisa Parker, the police chief in Manchester, uh, a few months ago about 
how police officers or across the board law enforcement is mm -hmm. perceived by right. certain groups of people or, or uh, publications right. uh, that put a, a spotlight on some of the negative that some rogue officers have right. done. Mm -hmm. And it across the country that kind of creates this mistrust with police right. or this, right. this hatred towards law enforcement. How do you, how do you work through that? How do you, you train your officers or your your department on how to uh, create continue uh, create a uh, cre continue continue to create a positive relationship with the community right. and to show that just because a couple officers across you know the country have right. you know done wrong that right. doesn't mean every police officer exactly. <laughs> is out there to for all the wrong reasons right we, we we say that about any group right we don't want to paint a broad brush with anyone, with any group, whether it's your religion, your race, whatever, your culture. Um, so every every group might have a few people that are not good. And we want to make sure that we understand that it's their behavior that's the problem, not the entire group. And the same with, with us. So what happens is somebody does something wrong. There's 900,000 police officers in the United States. Less than one-tenth of one percent are probably bad. But sometimes the media will grab that or somebody will grab it on their cell phone, they'll post it on social media, and people will automatically believe that we, the blue people, are the ones doing things wrong, and all of us are wrong. And obviously that's, that's and the only thing we can do is market ourselves a little better. And I always say to tell this story that <laughs> we're not a business, right? But we do have to market ourselves. We have to let the public know who we are. And that's why it's so important to do shows like this. And for our you know, media relations people and things to get the good out to catch people doing the right thing. And the more our officers interact with the public, the more they get to know us, how we really are. And then we are not the same as those few officers that might be caught on camera doing the wrong thing. So we do that a lot. And, and Julian Messina is our media relations specialist. And we spend a lot of time trying to market the agency to show everybody what we do, mm -hmm. all the different events we do, coffee with a cop, cookies with a cop, with the kids, our pros versus heroes game, our, or events downtown, all those things need to be out there so people see that because our product, even though we're not a company, is service. The return is not cash. That's what companies market for. Our return is trust. We need the public to trust us. And that's so important. And some of the police departments that fail is because they don't spend enough time doing that. We're letting the public understand who we are and what our job is. And the more we get our name out there, and the more our reputation gets out there, the better off we're going to be. And I think we're doing a pretty good job with that. We had, uh, just a couple of years ago, we had three um, suicide by cop shootings where the people basically wanted us to kill them instead of them killing themselves. Mm -hmm. In six months, we had eight officers involved with that. And the public trusted us because they knew that if the officers did the right thing, they would believe us, that it was investigated properly, and that's the outcome. They believed also that if we found the officers did something wrong and used excessive force in those cases, that they were going to be dealt with properly and they were going to be disciplined or whatever. And they were happy with that. We had zero negative press over those incidents. And similar incidents happened in Ferguson, and they obviously got blasted all over the media. Right. They didn't, they're a good police department, but they didn't have the relationship with their public. And that wasn't about Michael Brown, that mm -hmm. was about the relationship with the public. Um, the public knew that Michael Brown was a criminal and they probably understood that he probably deserved to be shot because he's trying to kill the officer. But at the same time, it was an opportunity for them to show their displeasure in the relationship with their police department. And I think that's what it meant. A couple of questions, a couple more questions. It will go into overtime. It looks like here, but, um, Paul Hulse is asking, how do you feel the Code Blue project is going heading into next year? Right. Hi, Paul. Paul, and thank, <laughs> thank you for all your help. Uh, Paul has been so instrumental in helping our homeless in this community um, and trying to find them placement and everything else. But in the meantime, while we're trying to you know, go through bureaucracy and trying to get them the services they need, Paul has been very instrumental in setting up Code Blue. Uh, where we set up in Riverwood Park, we have a Tudor building that's a rec center. And when it's below a certain uh, degree, 35 degrees, uh, we try to get the people in. They'll call us. We'll go pick them up as a police department. We'll bring them to the rec center, and they'll have shelter while that temperature is, is still dangerous for them. And then, obviously, there's uh, weather conditions and things like that mm -hmm. that make it even more dangerous. So um, I think it's it's working out very well. And Paul and other 
volunteers have been able to get these people in the shelter and get other services they need. So maybe there's an addiction issue. Maybe mm -hmm. there's a mental health issue or something like that. And he's able to get these people into the programs that they need. So it gives us that that one on one sometimes where we can identify those problems. Just like I said, the officers in school can right. identify the, off the problems with the kid early mm -hmm. and as well as with the teachers. They can identify kids problems early. Paul and his crew can identify some of these problems and get them the help they need. If they stayed in the woods or were somewhere else, we might not get that opportunity. So I think it's working very well. Holiday coming up, uh, Halloween, right. so big, exciting, <clears throat> fun. Uh, a couple of things I'm sure that, uh, that you would like extra security and stuff. Number one sure. being the Tom's River Halloween Parade right, right. and, of course, Mischief Night. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> I was talking to somebody from the Ocean County Library yesterday, a uh, video that everyone could see on our YouTube channel about Halloween. Uh, I said that it's it's probably, you know, concern for law enforcement everywhere, right. Mischief Night, although it's – primarily it seems something a, a Jersey thing and right. a little bit of Philly in New York and Delaware. Mm -hmm. But do you have to have added patrols on mischief night every year we or do. undercover cars? We do. Obviously we, we look at our stats from the year before and we look and see where all our problems are. So we put more officers in those areas. Uh, we have help from our class one officers or class two officers. Uh, we bring some people in on overtime and we try to target those areas at certain times. So, yeah, that, that works out. And, and I'm happy to say, and I hope I don't jinx myself here, but Mischief Night has, has been almost non-existent. We don't, we don't have a lot of issues, which is very good. I, I, think, I think people understand, kids understand, listen, they don't want to destroy their neighbor's house. You know, if they're throwing toilet paper over a bush or something, that's one thing. Yeah. But when you start throwing eggs and, and, and rocks and, and hurting people, that's, that's a different story. So I, I think we've been pretty lucky with that. Um, and the Halloween parade is obviously a concern. Anytime you have any event where there's a lot of people in one area, it's a concern for us. So we recently, instead of uh, saddling the, the sheriff's department or state police with bomb dogs and things, we just put on two brand new bomb dogs. And they work on both ends of the week. They're always around. And what we do now when we have a special event is we have these dogs sweep the entire area and they're trained to specifically sniff out anything that's an explosive, right? So once the area is swept, we have officers that now take their post, and we have plenty of officers working the parade. And there's a lot of officers that you don't even see. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are undercover. They're mingling with the crowd. They're on rooftops. We have the SWAT team out. So there's so many officers out there, and again, probably twice as many that you even realize. Um, and they're mingling with the crowd. They're, they're checking people. They're looking at behaviors and things like that. And we try to keep it, obviously, as safe as possible. I've never got a true count on the parade. No, uh, I think we're up to like 30 million or something to show up. It's but uh, <laughs> I think, no, I, people it say, you know, it, <clears throat> it is a big parade. Yeah. It's one of the biggest ones in the East Coast. It's, it's probably in the tens of thousands of, of people that show mm -hmm. up. I've heard estimates of hundreds of thousands or whatever. But it's, it's probably in the tens of thousands. And uh, we've been extremely lucky. Um, the, the residents, it's a great time for us to come out and interact with the public. We have a good time. The, the residents have a good time. They feel safe. And um, we usually end up with very little or few incidents uh, during the parade. So, if uh, For people who are going to the Tom's River Halloween Parade this year, what mm -hmm. do you need them to be mindful of or aware of if they see something or hear something, even if it's so they, they feel somebody may just be joking? Yeah. How can they... Yeah find the closest officer or do yeah. they have to, you know, just Absolutely. call 911? Same, same as always. We, we have so many officers. We have not only have stationary posts where officers at certain intersections, every single intersection will have an officer. Okay. That's even the small streets, Seward and Dover and, and Union and all those streets, uh, Lean Street. Um, every officer will be there. They'll, they'll be crossing guards. There'll be officers walking in between those two streets. There'll be special response teams where we'll have four officers, two on each side of the street walking together up and down the street. So obviously if you see something, grab one of us and point it out to us. We want to know. And you know what? No harm, no foul. If the person's not doing anything wrong, that's great. We're very polite. We send them on their way. If they are doing something wrong, you just averted a, a catastrophe. Call us on a cell phone, uh, call main headquarters, 911, whatever. Um, and we have a special command post right downtown on a separate frequency, just handling the downtown event. So even if you call in headquarters, a dispatcher will relay that to the command post downtown and we'll respond directly. And if we need reinforcements from outside the parade route, we'll bring them in too. Excellent, Chief. Thanks for coming in. Okay, thank you. This is the Great. first episode first of ever. Ask the Chief here on WOBM News on Facebook Live. For anybody who missed any portion of this or you want to watch the whole thing again, 
The video will stay on the 92.7 WOBM Facebook page and will be uploaded to the WOBM YouTube channel following the completion of this video here. Thank you to all of you for joining us. And of course, thank you to Times River Police Chief Mitch Little for joining us on the first episode of Ask the Chief. I'm Vin Ebenu and have a great day, everybody, and happy Halloween.